This is the podcast by the Straits Times. Welcome to Green Pulse, a podcast series by the Straits Times, where we analyze the beats of the changing environment, from biodiversity conservation to climate change. I'm your host Audrey Tan, and I cover science and environment for the Straits Times. My co-host is David Fogarty. Hi, I'm David, and I'm the climate change editor at the Straits Times. It is the 25th of November, and today we're discussing a potentially huge shift in the investment world. At the COP26 climate talk that wrapped up recently in Glasgow, nearly 200 nations finalised rules that will lead to the creation of new carbon markets. With us today is Mr. Richard Sainz, who is partner at Pollination, a specialist climate change investment and advisory firm who was at COP26 and can tell us more about what was agreed. Welcome to the show, Rick. Well, thank you for having me. So Rick, let's start by talking about carbon markets in general. They have, they have been around since before any discussions on Article 6, and there are two key ones, the voluntary market and the compliance market. What are the differences between the two? Yeah, it's a good question. So, so there have been two markets, uh, voluntary and compliance in, in broad strokes, but not there's not a compliance market and a voluntary market. There's a series of different activities and standards and geographies that are involved in one form or another. Over the years, there's been a number of different compliance markets. You, you know, everything from the, the EU emissions trading system to China's burgeoning emissions trading system, South Korea is an example, and California uh, in the United States, or something called the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative is another example of subnational compliance-based uh, trading systems. And uh, all along the way, uh, in addition to these examples of uh, compliance-based or legally created, governmentally administered programs, has been the voluntary market. And the voluntary market has you know, uh, been driven by a natural demand by certain types of companies corporates uh, and, and others that, that really want to take action that's not otherwise legally required to contribute to helping to reduce greenhouse gas emissions globally. And so whether they're looking at that from a, you know, reducing the emissions in their supply chain and, or just trying to lessen their overall um, direct uh, footprint there has been a number of activities that have been undertaken voluntarily. And what has emerged over the last couple of decades is a series of uh, international standards that are not governmentally created, but were created by, you know, in a voluntary context, but by, you know, recognized third party standards bodies. Got it. So how did the Glasgow meeting change or jazz up these two different markets? Glasgow is very important, and um, you know one of the primary imperatives, I would say, uh, of a successful COP26 in Glasgow was the completion of the agreement on the Article Six rules. Article Six is a term used to refer to the Article of the Paris Agreement that contemplates global cooperation, or basically, in layman's terms, carbon markets, and. Uh, there are unique provisions in Article 6, but they've now been agreed. There's still further technical work t- to be done to fully operationalize those uh, those political agreements on Article 6. is really important because it sets now the rules of the road for how countries will be able to use carbon markets and, and market-based cooperation. Article 6.2 is a flexible cooperative mechanism that sovereigns can agree on their own terms how to transfer the units. And so there's a whole set of guidance that has been agreed now in Glasgow for how you do Article 6.2. But fundamentally, it is up to the sovereigns to define that consistent with the guidance. Whereas Article 6.4 is a centralized mechanism administered by the Conference of the Parties whereby they will stand up a supervisory body that will be appointed, they will centralize it, they will centralize a registry, they will approve various methodologies and so forth. It looks a lot like the clean development mechanism and the supervisory process or what was known as the executive board at that time. 
And in both cases, there is an opportunity for the sovereigns to authorize private parties to undertake activities through Article 6. So if you're doing, if you're in Article 6 too, and you have two sovereigns that want to do a bilateral transaction, they can authorize private private parties to be the actual implementers of the activities that give rise to the emission reductions. And that's where the investment opportunities emerge. It's a lot like thinking of it as like a public-private partnership. What Article 6 has done, it has made clear that if a country wants to authorize an activity and then transfer that activity, that that emission reduction that's born from that activity that they authorize under the Article 6 rules, they need to undertake what's called a corresponding adjustment. And the idea here is that they want to have, the, the global system has to have a robust accounting mechanism so that you're not just transferring paper transactions and not actually knowing who's got wh- which credits and, and uh, you know, what's actually happening. And you don't want countries, you know, selling, quote unquote, uh, their carbon without properly accounting for that so that there's a ledger, a balanced ledger on are we collectively making progress and ensuring that we're, you know, on track to achieve overall mitigation in in global emissions through this trading mechanism. The idea behind Article 6 is not just trading for trading's sake. The idea is that it is a tool that can help countries increase their ambition towards actual reductions and go further faster at a more cost-effective means. Because, you know, as we know, the the science around climate is that a green, a molecule of CO2 or other greenhouse gas emitted anywhere is the same uh, to the atmosphere. So if the cost to reduce uh, emissions in one jurisdiction is less than it is in another, there's economic efficiencies in allowing those countries to to work out uh, an agreement on on you know investing in the reductions in country A for the benefit of country B. Overall, the global uh, atmosphere benefits, but only if the accounting system is actually you know tracking that. So there's this idea of that there should be no double counting, and that's really that's really fundamental uh, to the whole of it. And where private investors and you know companies are now looking at this and saying okay we understand the rules as they apply to the sovereigns how does this apply to us and i think there's two answers to that um, one is the basis for what is acceptable in terms of the methodologies in terms of the the transparency and the accounting for this will be you know not just uh, influencing what happens within Article 6, but it will it will set a standard. Now, if you like what you're hearing so far, do subscribe to our series Green Pulse on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. Like us and give us a rating. I mean, that's all. it all sounds really quite exciting. And it's, it's obviously Article 6 holds a lot of promise of ramping up carbon investment or offset investment in, in many different ways. So with all these new developments, and, and obviously, as you say, a lot of it has to be still sorted out. And also, what types of projects do you think will you know, are likely to attract the most investment? Yeah, well, the, you know, again, going back to the original point about voluntary markets and compliance markets, I think that, that nature has been really a source of a lot of the supply in the voluntary market. And I think that's likely to continue. And I think the voluntary market will be scaling alongside the Article 6, the formal Article 6 market. So let's just bear that in mind. It seems like a paradoxical that, you know, now we have compliance, why do you need voluntary? But the the evidence in all of these markets is whenever you put in place a compliance regime, it does tend to to attract more uh, activity, even in the voluntary market as well. So we, we think there's going to be an uptick. So you, you think about the, the huge challenge that's ahead, and there's trillions of dollars of investment needed to drive emissions down. Um, now, you know, a big part of that, and frankly, so far, an underfunded part of that is related to nature and reforestation, forest conservation in the sense that if there is deforestation occurring and you can track the historic rates of deforestation, 
And obviously, deforestation ties to emissions. You can reduce those emissions from that historic rate by undertaking interventions. That's red plus. And so that's certainly going to be part of it. But there are all kinds of, you know, this is the beautiful thing about markets is that it, it provides an, an incentive for innovation. And we need innovation. We need more tools, not less. So nature is a big opportunity there. And the other is, yeah, I think, methane. You know, when you look at what happened in Glasgow and the focus and attention on methane that came out of some of the early announcements and obviously the, the compelling uh, science around the dramatic global warming uh, uh, potential that, you know, methane has in, in the short, short term, you know, uh, 80 plus times the, the potency of uh, CO2, there's going to be a renewed focus on methane. And I think, you know, that will provide opportunities for governments who need a financial support to help, you know, implement measures to reduce methane leakage, flaring, and the like. Uh, I think there's an opportunity there. So Rick, Tell me, what kind of innovations are you seeing uh, in terms of nature? So when you think about soil carbon and sustainable agriculture and other practices, there's uh, something called blue carbon, you know, looking at seaweed farming and other types of, uh, of activities that nature can provide. That's really important. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of win-wins with nature, too. We're not just facing a climate crisis. We're facing a, a biodiversity crisis at the same time. And then the third one is just basic uh, infrastructure and actual physical risks to a changing climate. And if you think about coastal uh, damage and erosion, you know, a mangrove, smart design and reforestation of mangroves along coastal ways provides a number of different services and benefits. So I think nature is going to play a prominent role in helping us be part of the solution. And let's not forget, you know, there are other really exciting technologies called direct air capture systems, which are engineered solutions. And what do they do? They take CO2 that's in the atmosphere, they, they, they uh, bring it into their system and they convert it from CO2 into oxygen and capture that CO2. Well, that's what a tree does, you know? It's a pretty good uh, direct air capture device. And so we have that technology, nature's provided it to us. And we just need to make sure that we're we're planting a lot more trees, conserving the forests that we have, and then looking at the agricultural practices around the value chain of agriculture, frankly, that can do a lot more. And you know, the thing about agriculture that's exciting is that it actually can be part of the solution. It hasn't been in the sense of the way it's been done historically, but it is working with nature and the land. And so if you can integrate regenerative practices that actually allow the soils to uh, sequester more carbon uh, and, and you know, bring down or draw down carbon from the atmosphere, that, that's a very powerful tool that um, you know, we need. We need that and we need to support that. So Rick, earlier we did talk a bit about standards. How do you think the Article 6 rules will help this market grow and become more respected? Yeah, f great question. So what I think Article 6... And I think what we'll see is a, a much more uh, uh, sophisticated uh, set of methodological approaches, oversight, MRV, monitoring, reporting, and verification. You know, what the, the amount of the degree to which I should say the technology allows us to have a way more sophisticated tracking and measurement and verification of, of what's actually happening on the ground. Is, is light years ahead of where it was under the clean development mechanism. So the system needs to reflect the innovations, the technologies, the advancements that have occurred over the last you know, 10 plus years uh, in the space. And it's happening at a very fast pace with respect to some of these, these monitoring technologies, satellite imagery and the like. It's, it's really exciting what's happening in that regard. And I think that Article 6, and, and including the voluntary markets that, that will sit alongside it will benefit from that. And I, and I am hopeful and I expect that that will lead to more confidence, more robustness in the system as a whole. But it is up to the actors in the system to, to administer it with prudence. And that's, you know, we need to hold the whole system to account in that regard and make sure that this is 
a robust tool because there are a number of well-meaning you know civil society groups and others who who have some degree of skepticism around these markets they worry that that it's just a bunch of paper transactions that isn't going to lead to you know real reductions and it's 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 incumbent upon the advocates and actors in that market to demonstrate the propriety of using these tools it will take a while to operationalize these new rules you know countries are at different levels of development and there are still lots of basic things to sort out so Perhaps you could talk a little bit about that in, in terms of what happens next, in terms of how long it might take to get uh, these new markets sort of up, up and running, new rules, uh, and, and some of the concerns you were just referring to sort of you know sorted out. Yeah, I think there's something when we think about this that's important to remember, and it's a principle that's embedded in uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the notion of common but differentiated responsibility. And what that basically means, and it's it's essentially baked into the Paris Agreement itself by, by virtue of having every country uh, submit a nationally determined contribution. This is not a top-down, one-size-fits-all uh, system. It is, it is, in truth, a bottom-up, nationally determined system. And there is differentiation in terms of capacity to be able to uh, do the things that are necessary to undertake participation in Article 6. And it's going to take some time. There is a work program that's been called for. Uh, some of the decisions will be uh, you know, set to be agreed in November of 2022, but others probably will roll out over a longer period of time. And that's even at the, at the COP level or at the international level. And then you have the mechanics of the architecture and infrastructure necessary for a country to actually participate. They need to have a national registry. They need to be able to designate who their designated national authority is. They need to have an authorization process. They need to be able to facilitate their obligation to correspondingly adjust those units and track them and trace them and so forth. So so that's not something that you know exists today in all countries. So I see a transition. I see, I see a pathway to this that rolls out over a period of time, you know, and it's not going to be a date certain, but it'll, it'll, you know, it'll happen. And I think in an accelerated time, I'd be surprised if by 2025, you know, the vast majority of the system wasn't all fully into article six, but there may be some outliers, you know, for national circumstances and so forth. Um, and, you know, but we should be working on on ramping this stuff up as fast as possible because there's urgency here. And a ton uh, avoided or reduced today is important. Um, we we, we want to get as much out of the atmosphere, draw down as much as we can, as soon as we can. It matters. Oh, thank you so much, Rick. Um, Article 6 is really one of the least accessible parts of the Paris Agreement, so we appreciate you taking time out to explain it to us. Thanks, Rick. It was really, really good. No, it's my pleasure. Well, that's a wrap for Greenhouse and we hope you enjoyed our discussion. For more on climate change and the environment, do check out our stories in The Straits Times. And don't forget to subscribe to our Greenhouse podcast series on your favourite audio apps, Apple Podcasts, Spotify or Google Podcasts. That was an SPH podcast by The Straits Times. Find us on Spotify, Apple or Google Podcasts or streaming on Google Home. Do feedback to us at podcast.sbh.com.sg. You can also check out more podcasts on various topics at The Straits Times, The Business Times and Money FM 89.3.